the pain is coming for you. It is, it is coming for you, right? Yeah. Like, it, it, oh. it, you know the day is coming, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so we can either, you know, train and get in the ring and start, you know, feeling what it feels like to get punched on our own terms, yeah. right? Or we can, we can wait for fate to come and punch us in the face when we're not expecting it, right? And if you bring pain upon yourself, you mm -hmm. grow from that. Uh, when, because you, you had to, you had to make the choice, right? It's like when I was running this morning and I was, you know, busting ass, you know, trying to run that five miles as fast as I could, I, I could have just lollygagged. I could have like, you know, I didn't even have to run the miles at all, but I, I wanted to like get that pain. I wanted to feel that pain. I wanted to like grow from that. Right. I, I chose that. Right. Whereas if pain is subjected upon you, you don't have a choice, so you don't really get credit for it, right? It, it didn't require anything, like you didn't stick your hand in the fire, right? The fire came and engulfed your hand. There's a, there's a big, big difference in that choice, and, and that's where, where the growth occurs. So I want to, you know, take the pain that's going to come anyway, <laughs> and I want to grow from that and, and, uh, and then be ready for, for the other things that, that are going to come in life. And so that's, you know, that's really the, the, the thing about it is it's like, you know, and, and really, you know, I think that one thing I think about too, kind of in relation to those book titles is this idea that, Hey, what's going on? I wanted to do an intro for this interview because, uh, first of all, John Sanmez, uh, I followed him for a long time. He has an amazing channel. You should definitely check out on YouTube called Bulldog Mindset, where he talks about all, you know, everything having to do with success in your life, setting and achieving goals. Uh, in this interview, we get into some of John's mindset on you know how he thinks about achieving goals and specifically how he thinks about pushing through the pain. Uh, you should definitely stick around for this interview to the end because John uh, really, really gets into some of his deep psychology about two thirds of the way through the interview. Uh, I want to do this intro to let you know that the audio <clears throat> on my end of the call is off for about the first 10 minutes, but it picks up after that and I get the, uh, the right mic going. Uh, at that point. But uh, other than that, we're going to talk a lot about mindset, success, and how you can set and achieve goals. So I hope you enjoy this interview with John Sanmas. So, um, I, this year was kind of a year of kind of figuring things out, making the shift and everything. So I don't have a huge project that I'm working on right now, right? I mean, the biggest thing I'm working on personally is, is training for a marathon. So I'm, I'm working on that. But uh, I have, uh, you know, I'd say probably the big project that I have coming up that's in the works is, is a book, a Bulldog Mindset book. So I'm going to be writing that. I'm working on the book proposal now. And that's a book that I plan to do with a, a big five publisher this time around. So it's, it's going to be a pretty, pretty big undertaking. But, but yeah, that's, I think that's probably the biggest thing right now. Okay. Yeah, I know. I saw recently in some of your videos, you started to shift a little bit from talking about <clears throat> just focusing on, you know, maximal output and, 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 being you know, as productive as possible with a number of goals to kind of improving your lifestyle. So would you say this shift for you is in that vein, improving your lifestyle and why a marathon? Why is that something you really want to go deep on and focus on? Yeah. So, so yeah, I think there's probably two, two parts to that, which the first part is, is yes. I think it, a lot of what I'm focusing on now has been more about improving the lifestyle. There's sort of this thing I talk about a lot about, uh, it's like the utility value, right? And so the utility value of, of money, of time, of effort, uh, it, it is sort of on this scale, right? So, you know, the best way I think I could describe this is like with the utility value of money, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're making like $40,000 a year, right? You know, because because you have all these these people that, that say like, I think you probably have, uh, you, you've got the really conservative people that would say, uh, no, you know, cut out the Starbucks, right? If you save $2 a day on coffee, you can put this into an investment fund, you can make this return and it'll be yeah. $50,000 by the time you're 50, right? That's yeah, hard uh, to great. Yeah. And then, and then you've got the kind of the remit, remit set the, who's, who's kind of famous for saying, I don't know, just get the coffee, get the coffee, make more money, make more money. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. 
and and that's I, I think they're both right and they're both wrong. It depends on the context, right? And that's the utility mm-hmm. value. So if you're someone making forty thousand a year, you you do, you don't need the coffee, right? Like saving that money, saving like maybe a thousand dollars that year is going to be mm-hmm. big. It's going to be huge. It's going to be mm-hmm. something that is going to benefit you immensely with investing or you know setting up the, the rest of your life. If you're making two hundred thousand dollars a year, fucking get the coffee. <laughs> Yeah, like it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter. Like it's not like don't cut any coupons, right? Don't save like don't try and save. You know, I used to have a, a five dollar rule, and now I've got a twenty dollar rule, which basically says that like anything that's five dollars or less, I don't even think about it. Don't save any money trying to save five bucks. Like don't waste any, not a second or, or a thought. Now right. it goes for twenty dollars, but that has to do with the utility value of money. So now we could translate that to kind of time and effort. And in my career, in my life, there were times when I, I mean, I am a firm believer in the Gary V hustle, right? That, mm-hmm. that, you know, just hustle grinding, grinding, grinding. But at the same time, I think, again, there's a utility value to that. So earlier in my career, I put my nose to the grindstone. I was working 70, 80 hour weeks, just busting ass on, on work and building my business and, and accumulating wealth and, and investments and things like that. And there, it was valuable to do it at that time. Yeah. But yep. now it's it sort of, you know, it, it can kind of think of it as, as pushing a boulder up a hill and it's really hard and then you get to the top of the hill and then the boulder kind of rolls down on it. You, you can kind of ride the boulder down the hill. So yeah. I'm more of in a stage in my life now where I can ride the boulder down the hill a little bit. So mm-hmm. it, it's sort of, you know, th- that benefit, the value that you get from putting in the 80 hour a week doesn't benefit you as much, right, in your actual life than than it did before when you're earlier in your career when you're just making it you know in business and you're, you're starting up as an entrepreneur so I've kind of come to that realization and so I've sort of balanced things out a little bit more so I just said well you know what if I gave myself a year to kind of do whatever I wanted to do have a little bit more free time and I as I started doing that I started to realize that I actually do like busting ass but maybe not as much as yeah. I was before right the utility value is not there as much so i think it's important to recognize that in life is is those points where you know otherwise you know no offense to uh warren buffett but i mean the guy lives in in the house that he bought you know like in like 1980 or something like that right like his original home and i I think i mean you know i think he's happy there but but my point is that that like he's not using the utility value of his well he's still like someone who's poor like saving like and and you know you might say that's a good virtue and if he's happy that's fine but uh, but for most people i think they get trapped in one mode right mm-hmm. and they don't realize that it's a scale because you because you get this mindset baked into your head right and you get yeah. this mindset of like either busting ha- ass working hard and you know or in saving money right and then you don't realize when you get to a certain level that you need to you know you need to prioritize things different that that value that utility value of time of money of effort is not as great anymore and so you it may be that you can better spend that effort that time that money somewhere else you can live a little bit more luxurious life you can spend a little bit more time having free time right you can put in a little bit less effort into things and so that's kind of where i'm where i've been kind of exploring uh this year but the marathon thing is a totally different uh, I don't even know why the hell I did that. that was, <laughs> yeah. I was started Extreme. running. I was trying to get in shape a little bit when I was uh, I was traveling Europe, so I always tried to like come back better than 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 I than I left, and so I was gone for about two months. And okay. so I started running. I was running like five miles a day. I started saying, "Oh well, you know, let me let me start running my ten mile runs." Double uh, it. <laughs> so I started running ten mile runs. And, and then, you know, by the time I had started running, I was like, Oh, one Sunday I was like ran a 15. And then oh, wow. after that, when I got back home, I was like, Oh, I, I bet I could run a 20. So I ran a 20 and then I was like, next day I was signing up for a marathon. So there yeah, you go. already there, already there. Yeah. Um, yeah. wow, that's crazy. So yeah, one thing you talked about that's kind of interesting is, um, you, you mentioned pushing this boulder up the hill until you get to that point where it turns and it has its own momentum. And in some of your videos, you talk about some of your income and like for most normal individuals, that's more than they would ever need. But at w- how do you, how do you define that for yourself? Cause you think about someone like, yeah, you know, everybody knows like Jeff Bezos pushing this mm-hmm. boulder up the hill for 20 plus years. Yeah. You know, waiting for the other side. How do you define where you want that? Is it something that other people dictate or how did you come up with that point where it's enough and I can kind of 
enjoy some of this, maybe look for balance? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, it, it's kind of, it's an interesting thing, I think, because I'm the kind of person, I'm very Spartan in my, in my yeah. living and lifestyle. I mean, I kind of, I always joke to people that like I could handle prison cause I already live like a fucking prisoner. Like, <laughs> I mean, I do like hard fucking labor every day, like running, yeah, yeah. busting my ass, lifting weights. I only eat once a day, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. like it's, I, I could, I could do that. So so I, I don't need a lot of a lot of comforts in life, right? You know, I, I for the last I finally am buying a new car, but for the last mm-hmm. fourteen years I drove the same like two thousand five Toyota Corolla. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. so I don't really need that much money, um, <laughs> you know. I, but I like to spend on on certain things, like on on technology, like to go out and have a good time and eat at nice restaurants and and, and things like that. So so that's where where I'd, I'd spend my money. But so so as far as like needing the money. I don't really need it. What I want is like my base level is just to have freedom, which mm-hmm. I can have at a very low cost, right? I could probably, I could probably live pretty comfortably off of five thousand dollars a month if it's mm-hmm. passive income, and yeah. then I'd have my freedom, right? Uh, you know, obviously I do, I do better than that, and I and I and I keep pushing it further than than that, but I don't really need that much more. For me, for me, like. It's it's more now about the sense of improvement and accomplishment, mm-hmm. and improving myself. It's about that journey, right? Then that's kind of you know I think when you talked about like what does bulldog mindset stand for and was the channel you hit it right on on the head when you're talking about the idea that it's it's like separating the outcome, right? For because yeah. for me it's not the outcome. It's about what who do I become on this journey? And I know that in order to grow as myself, I need to be pushing myself. I need to be constantly achieving, right? You know, I think Tony Robbins says that, uh, that, that growth or progress or uh, gro- growth is happiness. Progress is happiness essentially. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, but the question remains like, why do some people, why do some, you know, millionaires, billionaires keep on pushing, keep on trying to, to make more money, keep on going that, you know, you've got the, Elon Musk's and uh, Jeff mm-hmm. Bezos and and uh, I think there's a few other ones. I, I wouldn't. I actually, I'd say Richard Branson is probably the, the kind of the opposite of that. He's he's more like me. <laughs> but um, but you, you've got those those personalities. And you know, I think it's just a question you have to answer for yourself. Is like, what are you trying to get out of this? And are you enjoying the ride? And you know, in in, in I, I think for most people though, I would say that figure out probably the highest thing that's going to bring you the most benefit in life is going to be whatever your freedom number is, right? So if you're free and you have your time and you can do what you want with that time, whether that be to work your own business or to, you know, whatever it is, that's, that's that, that key point, right? Okay. And so I think you can achieve kind of that optimization of, of, of the, the benefit, the value of it. That's, that's where maybe, you know, you don't stop, but there's something that changes when you don't have to work anymore, right? It's like, I'm still working, I'm still building a business, I'm still making money, but I know in my head that I don't have to do any of this stuff and it makes it a much more enjoyable experience as opposed to, you know, you can imagine the exact opposite of that, like indentured servitude, right? Yeah. Which a lot of jobs are almost like that. Like if you got a college degree and you paid like, you know, oh, like $100,000 in student debt, you're basically an indentured servant, servant right? Like you yeah. resent your job, you have to go to work, you don't really have a choice. Uh, that's, that's, you know, it doesn't even matter if the work is great, you're going to feel that. Right. So, so that's, that's kind of how I, how I look at that situation. Hmm. That's interesting. And you mentioned your freedom number. So the biggest one that comes to mind for me is like you said, whatever your passive income level is to just live off your, you mentioned 5,000 as an example. And then the point where you don't have to work, which for a lot of people means, you know, they have enough in investment to reasonably expect that that'll carry them through their life. Which, which ones of those are, do you think more important? And what are the differences in your lifestyle you notice when you're, reach both of those milestones like how do things change for you so between which ones which numbers did you say now the, the when freedom you started to have like a stable job that wasn't stressing you out too uh-huh, much yeah. and then when you got enough to where you're like you know what i probably wouldn't have to work another day if i don't want to yeah so you know i don't know it's hard to say like i i've i've lived on pretty low income at times mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. 
Like, I mean, I can sleep on the floor. Like, I'm, I can eat ramen noodles. Like, I don't have any problem. Yeah. Like, I can, I can tough it, obviously. So maybe things didn't change. I don't know. Yeah, so it didn't – I mean, it was nice when I could – I guess, you know, for me, the turning point was when I didn't have to look at the checkbook. Like, yeah. I just know there's money there, right? I, and if I never have to balance a checkbook, I think that's kind of – was the turning point for me. And I don't know where that number was, to be honest. Maybe it was – when I was making like maybe 60 or 70,000 a year, it, was, it wasn't a huge number because I didn't spend a lot of money. So I, I yeah. didn't have to worry about that. It was, there was a big buffer pretty, pretty quickly there. But the freedom number for me, like when I quit my job, actually when I first quit my job, I was really conservative, right? I'm still pretty conservative as far as, you know, the financial risk and, and, and planning things out. But I was, I was pretty far over, you know, the, the pass of the 5,000 a month. That's kind of what I had estimated was about five, five K a month was mm -hmm. uh, for, for passive income. But, but yeah, but I would say, you know, in general though, like, you know, to, to give some guidance on, on answering this question, I, I think the biggest mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make with this, this kind of freedom number is they think that it needs to be what replaces their, their income. Yeah. Right. So they say, OK, so I'm making like one hundred thousand dollars on my job. So when my business makes one hundred thousand dollars, passive or not, I guess. Right. I could quit my job. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not that's that's bad. That's not true, because the, the thing is, like, you want to exit the rat race as fast as possible, because when you're working a job, even if you like it, when you're working for someone else, you're building their empire. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not it's you're trading dollars for hours. You're, you're not getting any kind of real benefit aside from some of the education and connection that, that you make. Right. So you want to get out of that situation as, as fast as possible. And that's going to allow you to grow your business and to make passive income and things just exponentially faster. So the secret to that, the key is not in growing your business so much because that's a harder thing to do part time. Right. The, the key is reducing your expenses. Right. If you can be that Spartan dude that sleeps on the mattress and re eats ramen noodles and you can find happiness in that lifestyle. Yeah. And you can believe me. I mean, some, to some degree, the simplicity is better, but you know, so you far, you for, uh, forego the, the car. So you don't have any car payment, you know, you, you get your rent. Maybe you have to bunk with, uh, with a roommate and, you know, and you share, share a room in a, in a house. So you get really cheap rent, right? Or maybe you're living in your parents' basement. I don't know, like, you know, whatever you got to do, you get to the point, if you get to the point where you could live off of like, say like 2K a month, shit, you could, you could basically like retire real damn quick, right? I mean, yeah. like who can't build a business that makes about 2K a month in about a year? Like, I, I think that with all the information we have out here, anyone can successfully do that. You could be out of the rat race right then. Now, you're not going to be wealthy. You're not going to be rich. But the but the thing to remember is that you're not going to stay at that two k a month number, right? Yeah. It's, it's going to be maybe some some pain and some sacrifice. But but over time, now you're going to have all that time. Now you're going to have eight hours a day back, and you can use that to invest in your business. Mm -hmm. And and now now you now you can grow it up, right? And, and so that's and that I think that's the key is that, and then you start to build up that passive income. You start to build up the, the point where where you can live more comfortably, and so yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's the thing that I, I see. You know, I'd say just based on the kind of questions you're asking here, that most entrepreneurs make this this huge mistake, and and they're trying to make like eight k of passive income or eight k a month from their business, and it yeah. takes them forever. They get frustrated because they they want to replace their regular income, and that's that's it's not the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just a lot of online courses telling people they're going to make 50 K K a month in a year. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. You don't need uh, that. Yeah. Don't need it. Uh, I love yeah. the 2 K actually, because that's a great, that's like a great number that I think is super realistic for most people. It's like a year, 2 K you could probably yeah. do that. Um, and I like it too, because it actually relates to this video. So you, this video, uh, the 50 miles a day video really recent, you talk about how the phrase all try, is setting yourself up to fail at whatever you're doing. And part of that is committing fully to whatever you're going to do and just saying, I'm going to do it. Like I'm going to find a way to do it. I'm going to will myself through. The other side of that is the size of your goal. I feel like for some people, if they try that on too big of a goal and they fall on their face, it's hugely demotivating. And that's why I like this idea about 2K a year, these really realistic goals where you're like, if you absolutely commit to it, it's reasonable you can do this. How do people balance that and not set these goals that just are 
going to cause them to fail? Something that they can really commit to. How do you pick something that's realistic for you to commit to? So I'll, I'll start by backing up a little bit and just kind of giving you my idea on goals. I really don't like goals that are not within your control. Again, yeah. talking about like being outcome in, independent, right? So yeah. I'll give you a good, good, some examples here, right? So some people are like, oh, my goal is to make a million dollars this year. Yeah. Well, you cannot control that. There's yeah. no direct control over that. Mm-hmm. that you, if your business is making 500,000 and you want to grow it 500,000 more, you mm-hmm. cannot directly control that. But what you can do is you could make a goal. Let's say that your, your business is, is big ticket sales. You could say, uh, my goal for this year uh, that will probably get to me to a million dollars would be to uh, contact a thousand potential customers and get on calls for a thousand leads for, for my big ticket sales that I'm, I'm selling. And then I could break that down and I could say, you know, every week I need to, you know, I get, my goal is to hit 20 prospects or 50, pro- whatever, you know, whatever you, you want to do. And you can absolutely control that. And that should get you to that goal, right? So this is kind of how I, I, I do goal setting is I've got, a, I've got an idea. I've got a number, right? I've got, I've got a thing in my mind, but I don't think the same thing like we could say with like, let's say I was going to lose weight. I want to lose 20 pounds. Mm-hmm. I can't control losing 20 pounds. I actually literally can't physically control that. But if I cut my calories down, you know, if I'm in a thousand calorie a day deficit of what I estimate, and I'm doing cardio and I'm right. So I can control all those things and I can make that routine and I can say every week I need to, you know, hit the gym three times, run 30 miles. I need to, you know, be in a thousand calorie deficit or, or eat these things. I can absolutely control that. I can have a hundred percent success with that. And then I could predict that by following that I should lose 20 pounds, right? That's the, so I, so I can basically create a process again. You know, I always talk about trusting the process that can get me to that, that goal. That's why I don't like to see those kind of like num number goals, like anything that you can't directly control, you can't really make a goal for It's more of like an aspiration. And then you can actually set concrete goals from that because I only like to have goals that are completely within my control. Otherwise you're, you're setting yourself up for, for failure. Um, but you know, the other aspect to that, right. is, is what you're talking about is like realistic, right? So I was just having a conversation with a buddy of mine, uh, on, on the plane as we, as we're going to a conference and we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the why and is the why powerful enough to have you achieve any goal. And okay. my argument to him was, no, it's not. It has, it's an intersection of the why being strong enough and your, your beliefs, right? And, and, and it's like, we've all got these limiting beliefs that, that hold us back. But if I can't believe in my head that this goal, this thing is possible, mm-hmm. it's, it, it doesn't matter how strong the why is. If I don't think I'm capable of it, I'm not going to be able to do it, right? So mm-hmm. now the stronger your why is, the more it can sort of, you know, it can sort of compensate for not having that full belief. So you got to find that intersection. And that's why it, it makes sense to make, you know, you can't make a goal. You can't say, well, I'm going to make $10 million this year, right? Which, which may be possible. I mean, anyone could do that. It is possible. Mm-hmm. But if you're making $100,000 a year, you cannot believe it. Like your brain will not believe that you could do that. And so, it, so you're not going to be able to fully commit to that. It's not going to be successful. You got to find something that you could actually believe that's outside of your, your comfort zone and, and that has a big enough why to connect you to it. And the bigger the why is of why you got to do it, the less that that belief is, the more that you can kind of stretch that, that, you know, that zone. So, you know, I, I think a good example would be if you, if you had a goal of, let's say, making a million dollars this year. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and let's say it's pretty far outside of your belief, your, your comfort zone, let's say you're making a hundred thousand dollars or a couple hundred thousand. If it was, if your why was, well, because I just want to, I want to do it. Like I'll consider myself, I've made it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's going to be like, you're not going to believe it. Like it's not going to, it's not, it's not as likely to happen. Even if you fully yeah. commit, right. It's going to be hard to fully commit. But, if your why is because your uh, your spouse your your let's say your 
daughter or son, your child is in the hospital and they, they, they're going to die if they don't get this operation and it costs a million dollars. Now look how much your chances of achieving that goal have increased because that why is so powerful, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of us could figure out a way to, to make a million dollars if we, if our child's life depended on it. Right. Uh, so we, we would commit and we'd, we'd have that belief uh, at that point. So, so there's a balance there, right? It, it's, you, you can't set goals that are too big. Uh, and, and like I said, and in fact, I, I try to take that goal and then make it, I, I call that goal an aspiration when it's a monetary one and try to make actual goals that are, are things that you can actually achieve that you are there are hundred percent in your control and always you can figure that out, right? You can always figure out, I mean, with YouTube, I had the goal of, of basically getting a hundred thousand subscribers. I remember when I, when I started out and mm -hmm. again, I would call that my aspiration. I can't yeah. control, I can't like make, <laughs> right? Like yeah. there's no, I have no direct control, but I yeah. said to myself, I said, what kind of thing could I do that would make it so that it'd be very, very likely 95% chance that I would have a hundred thousand subscribers. And my mm -hmm. answer was, well, get 2000 videos out there, right? So then I said, okay, well, someone with 2,000 videos probably will yeah. have 100,000 subscribers, right? Yeah, That's yeah. My logic, I can, I can control making 2,000 videos. So mm -hmm. then I said, okay, well, how fast do I want to do this? Well, I want to do this in about, you know, a couple of years. So I need to make like, uh, on average, like at least two videos a day, like two and a half videos a day. So that was my goal. It was a goal I could achieve. I set that goal and I accomplished that goal. And by the time I'd hit 100,000 subscribers, well before I hit uh, 2,000 videos. So, oh, man, man, that is so interesting. This is like probably the biggest reason I want to talk to you is I feel like you have some of the best information I've ever seen on achieving goals. And it's interesting because it's like the whole way you go about it is, is almost the opposite of what most people talk about. Like I hear a lot of people talk about focus on the process, but at the same time, I think people don't take the heart what you were saying about belief, uh, mm -hmm. you know, versus your why, because you've probably seen that video that it's, it's, it's a motivational video where they talk about, you know, if you, if you want to achieve something like you want to breathe and they have the example of the guy like walking out oh, yeah. to the ocean and getting held underwater, they're like, then you'll achieve it. I feel like that's responsible for more people failing at life than like any other video, because it doesn't matter how much you want to achieve something. If you have zero belief, you're going to do it. Right. And right. I love your example about the hospital. It's like, you know, maximal why their kid's going to die, maybe small belief, but it doesn't matter at that point. But it's like, you can never have zero of one or the other. They have to right. be somewhere. Uh, and I just think that's awesome. Like the thing with 2000 videos, I would never think of that, but it's such a simple way to be realistic about this is like a very easily broken down process of, you know, if I have 2000 videos, chances are my subscribers will be somewhere from zero to 100,000 closer, closer to a hundred thousand. Um, man, I love that. <laughs> just so much good stuff. You talk about, you did mention the uh, was it the conference you're at? Was that the one you mentioned in some video about going to Vegas? Is this the one recently? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. I went to uh, thrive conference. Yep. Okay. How was that by the way? I haven't got a chance to read all about it, but it was good. Yeah. It's, it's a very good conference. They, they put together a good uh, Cole Hatter puts it on and he puts together a good selection of speakers. I really go to conferences now for the networking, for the, for the people that are there. I like to do the conferences where there's a lot of, a lot of good, people and i find that thrive has a lot of really good people is it there's a lot of real estate people if if you're interested in real estate investments so that's that's always good because cole is into that and they he always brings out really good speakers i got to be uh i met uh, jesse itzler uh, there so oh, wow. that, that was pretty <laughs> cool so yeah yeah some big names uh yeah and you you actually mentioned a book from there uh awaken the alpha you had an interview with the gentleman who wrote that book and you mentioned another book in that interview, What Doesn't Kill You. Uh, oh, yeah. And yeah. Book. And you talk about how those two titles, What Doesn't Kill You and Awaken the Alpha, really stand out, you know, and they immediately grab you. Yeah. What about the attitude in those kind of books or their message is important to you? What do you think people should know about those, those two mindsets? Yeah, you know, I would say, well, definitely the, the one that, that grabbed me, you know, that I was like, well, I just have to buy this book 
was yeah. that what doesn't kill you, right? Because that's yeah. that's something like, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people in both of these things, it's like our our natural aversion is to 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 run away from pain or things that are hard. And yeah. what we really should be doing is trying to seek those things out and running into those things because those are the things that are going to produce growth in us, mm-hmm. right? And that's that's the more important thing. It's sort of, you know, when we get into the kind of meta, like, why are we here on this earth and, and what really brings us happiness, you know, as I, I talked about before with Tony Robbins is, is growth brings us happiness, progress, right? We have to progress in order to be happy. And so we should be seeking that out because the thing is, like, the pain is coming for you. It is, it is coming for you, right? Yeah. Like, it, 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 you know the day is coming, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so we can either, you know, train and get in the ring and start, you know, feeling what it feels like to get punched on our own terms, yeah. right? Or we can, we can wait for fate to come and punch us in the face when we're not expecting it, right? And that's, that's yeah. the thing. That's kind of how I, I view life. And, you know, I think maybe both of those book titles kind of, you know, give it, give a glimpse into, into my psychology, but, but it's so much better, right? Like, you know, and I, I talk about this a, a few times, but, but essentially like if you bring pain upon yourself, you mm-hmm. grow from that uh, when, because you, you had to, you had to make the choice, right? It's like when I was running this morning and I was, you know, busting ass, you know, trying to run that five miles as fast as I could, I could have just lollygagged. I could have like, you know, I didn't even have to run the miles at all, but I I wanted to like get that pain. I wanted to feel that pain. I wanted to like grow from that. Right. I, I chose that. Right. Whereas if pain is subjected upon you, you don't have a choice. So you don't really get credit for it. Right. It, it didn't require anything like you didn't stick your hand in the fire. Right. The fire came and engulfed your hand. There's a, there's a big, big difference in that choice. And, and that's where, where the growth occurs. So I want to, you know, take the pain that's going to come anyway. <laughs> and I want to grow from that and, and, uh, and then be ready for, for the other things that, that are going to come in life. And so that's, you know, that's really the, the, the thing about it is it's like, you know, and, and really, you know, I think that one thing I think about too, kind of in relation to those book titles is this idea that you, you really only like figure out who you are when you're, you know, in that kind of what doesn't kill you phase, right? Like there's, there's the normal level of, of operation and where you where you think that you're, you, you know, you're, you're putting on this show of, of who you are, you, you know, your, your character, like, cause things are going smooth, but when you're yeah. fucking hungry and you're tired and you're just like worn out and you're pushing yourself to the physical limit and all those things, now you figure out who you really are. And that's also the time when sort of like, you know, you can think of like that, that outer shell is like taken off and now you can actually grow. You can grow a new, you know, you, you can't grow as much in the place where you're comfortable. Like you've got to find that uncomfortable place and it takes, so, so when I see those opportunities, when I'm like, you know, and anything that's going to push me to that place, I don't think of it as, oh, I don't want to do this or this is painful. Although, you know, obviously, you know, no one likes pain, but I think of it as, look, here's an opportunity here. This is great. You know, again, probably why I signed up for that marathon. I was like, well, fuck, I hate this. I don't want to do a fucking marathon. So I'm going to sign up and fucking go through this and, and push through it. And, and that's going to, that's going to cause that growth. So. Okay. No, I love it. That, that totally makes sense. I have so many questions from there. I'm going to do one sort of abstract question here, which is for a lot of people when they pursue this pain, like they see this progress and they get just addicted mm. to going after this pain. And you often see it when someone gets really into like one domain, right? Like you've, you're one of the few people who've, uh, you've gone after big goals in all these different domains. But a lot of times, let's say work and fitness, people get addicted to one or the other and they just like get addicted to just the pain for pain's sake. How do you separate that so you don't get, you know, hamstrung in one area of life that you are comfortable in? How do you continually, you know, seek new types of experiences in your life and not get addicted to just like I'm grinding, I just work? Um, Because you've probably seen people that do that. I think it's hard sometimes for people when they get good at one thing to take that attitude to the rest of their life. How do you manage that? Yeah, you know, I, I see it as, you know, I have a very holistic viewpoint and I feel like it's like the, the weakest link, right, is is the, the, the weak spot in your life. And yeah. 
in, you know, it's sort of like if you don't develop in other areas of your life, you will not like, you know, you, you will limit your development in any area of your life, right? So, you know, it, even as when I, when I was a, doing my career as a software developer, right, I quickly discovered that soft skills and social skills were the limiting factor and not the tech. Like I could, I could keep on sharpening my technical skills, but yeah. it didn't yeah. matter, right? Because mm -hmm. it became harder and harder to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it had less value in, in my career, but just improving my social skills a little bit uh, it multiplied the value from those technical skills, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing in, in a lot of areas of life. You know, if you think about it in, in terms of fitness and work, right? If you, you know, for, for diet and, and whatnot, for, for example, right? So I've been fasting, you know, doing like one meal a day for the last three years or so. And so when it comes to like, hard work or doing something that is mentally taxing it, it's like it's 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 like it's like child's play i mean fuck like what are you gonna give me that's like and, and when people whine at me and they're like oh i'm hungry and like and you know i'm tired i'm like fuck like you don't even know what like you don't know, <laughs> you don't know what it's like to run 20 yeah. miles and you haven't eaten for two days like mm -hmm. that's that's fucking you know so so it, it's made me mentally tough, which allows me to do my work better, right? Uh, at the same token, you know, doing, you know, having gr grinded out in, in work and in, in making YouTube videos and making plural site courses and doing some of the stuff that I've done and writing a book, it makes it easier to, to fucking run t for four and a half hours to, to run a marathon because I know how to grind. I know how to just like go and, and, and do it. So I think that you'll see that, all these areas of life sort of lift each other up, right? It's if you grow in multiple areas at, at one time, you get this exponential effect. In fact, you know, Elon Musk, one of the reasons why people say he was so, he's so successful is because he's sort of a, a modern day Renaissance man, right? He oh, is yeah. a polymath, right? So he's got the physics background, right? And he's got the business background, right? He's got these multiple, angles right he's literally a rocket scientist and he understands business and and he has a very technical understanding as well and so those intersections at that that level it basically rises raises the whole thing up so mm -hmm. that's that's the thing is 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 to you know to, is to realize that you've got to grow as a person in in multiple areas and leaving any one of those completely you know uh, without training is, is going to affect all the other areas. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Your channel touches a lot on this and, uh, you seem to be the type of person that's not satisfied with strengthening your strengths and making them better. You seem to be like attacking weaknesses as well. Do you have a view one way or the other on that? Cause I've always kind of been so skeptical of that saying, like, what do you think of that? Yeah. So I, I, I tend to be contrarian on that, on the viewpoint. I know that mm -hmm. a lot of people advocate, you know, focusing on your strength. But mm -hmm. this is what I've found in life is that when you focus on your strengths, like your strengths that are natural, you take for granted, right? So mm -hmm. I think of it as, you know, I, I played a lot of role playing games and, you know, kind of like D and D type of games when I, when I was growing up and you'd mm -hmm. roll up stats for a character. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, there'd be these guys that would roll up, like, you know, keep rolling stats and keep rolling <laughs> stats, right? Yeah. Trying to get that 18 strength or whatever it is, and 18 slash 100 strength or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could spend hours doing that. And ultimately, like, those starting stats, like, if you took, like, a level one, right, anyone who's played an RPG or something, right? If you took a level one character with awesome stats, perfect stats, all 18s, right? Yeah. And they fought a level 20 character with shitty as hell stats, yeah. who's winning? Yeah. The, the, the level 20 character, the, the, it didn't matter what your starting stats were, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it matters that you're level 20, right? That's like, it's no contest, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so that's how I view life, right? It, it's mm -hmm. the same thing. It's like, okay, so you're naturally gifted in music. Oh, you're naturally gifted in math. You're naturally gifted in, as, in athletics. Big mm -hmm. fucking deal. It doesn't fucking matter because what you train is going to be so much more important. If you spend 10 years training some skill, even if you rolled a 12 in it, even if you have the low, like your aptitude was so low, it was your weakness, but you mm -hmm. trained it for 12 years, you're going to be better than someone who was a, a, a natural, who had a, a really high skill level, just as, as a natural skill level 
in, in that and didn't train it very much or didn't train it as hard. And what, what I find is that, again, you take those things for granted, right? So yeah. for, for instance, I was really good in math, right? I, I had somewhat of a natural talent in math. Mm. I am way better writer and communicator now than I am in math and writing in community. I mean, writing in English was the only thing that I would get bad grades in school. I didn't yeah. like it. I wasn't good at it. Right. But I, I can't really, I mean, I, I know, no, no, no. I mean, I'm not a, a, a theoretical physicist. Like I, I can't, like I can't do advanced level math. I haven't ever made any money off of my math skills in life or, or yeah. drawing, right? So, yeah. because the thing is, like, I took that for granted, right? Because I was good in math, so I didn't have to work as hard. So yeah. I just felt like, hey, I should just be good at math. I should just naturally, and, and that worked, you know, through kindergarten and first grade, and maybe you know, up to high school. It's like, okay, yeah. so you're good at math, so it comes easy for you. Okay, mm -hmm. so I didn't work as hard at it, but you know what? The writing, the communication, social skills, right? All of those things that were my weaknesses, physical, right? I was not an athlete out all right i was not gifted with any kind of athletic talent but yeah. i worked that shit hard and that's mm -hmm. the stuff that i mastered that's the stuff that i became uh, excelled at in life because i didn't take it for granted because i knew how much work it took to get there and so i prize that and so i keep on putting in the work whereas if it comes naturally and it comes easy for you you don't work as hard because it's natural so yeah no, totally, totally. I, and I agree about what you started with saying, the, uh, they compound all these different areas you could get at. It's not just like the additive effect. Um, so there you have it. Level up in life, transcend your level. Um, okay, back to the interview. So with these levels, you have all these different skills. Mm. I've seen so many different self-help books talk about uh, you know, the different areas of your life. Do you have any buckets, like well-defined buckets you you like to split up your life into, you know, people are like financial health, whatever. Like, uh, in, in what way? Like in, like in, I guess, uh, like, I... I guess in trying to improve yourself. Um, hmm. a lot of people will talk about like, you know, social skills, physically, financially, uh, your, your love life, uh, spiritual life, family. Do you have a way, like a mental model you split those up or not really? I say yes and no, right? So like I'm aware of the different different pieces of those, mm -hmm. but I do feel like they're very connected. Uh, okay. But but and and I will focus from time to time. So I feel like a lot of times you can't you can't split your focus too much, right? So I always have usually like one big goal and then yeah. one sub goal that I'm, that I'm working on. Right. And then a bunch of like other smaller stuff that can fall off. Cause, cause you always got to have one of the things that I found in life is that you always have to have one thing that you're always making progress on. Right. This is how you get to stay out of depression and you feel motivated. Right. So you don't mean the same thing. You just mean always at one time, one thing, right? Well, the same thing for, for some period of time, right? So, yeah, okay. yeah. you know, that you're always advancing it, right? Yeah. And that's your big, the big target, the big goal, right? And mm -hmm. then you have like a secondary thing that you pretty much always advance in, but if something has to drop, like you, you would, you would let that go, but the, but the one you won't, right? Yeah. And then you've got all these smaller kind of goals and stuff that you're working on and, you know, hopefully you're not dropping the ball on, but but, but those ones are not as important, right? So, because otherwise you become really lost, right? So for me right now, I'm working on the marathon, right? So I'm not going to miss a workout. I'm going to run. I'm going to make sure that I hit this, you know, under four hour time for the marathon. That's, that's my goal. That's my plan. You know, I'm, I'm executing on that and, and that's not going to drop. I'm going to continually be making progress in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to have those focus periods, right? So, you know, uh, there was there was a period in my life where I just worked on social skills, right? I just wanted to get better at being able to just go up and talk to anyone. And so I, I spent a lot of time reading a ton of books on that, going out there and doing that, practicing it, right? Developing that. Uh, so, so I find that like, you know, I, I tend to have these, these really deep kind of focus periods at a time. And, and then, you know, and then I, I kind of back off and it, it, things become habits, right? And, and that's sort of raise, raises the base level rather than, you know, I think maybe kind of what you're getting at is, is there's a lot of people that are like, okay, it's time to set my goals for the year. And they're like, here's my wealth goal. And here's my, my yeah. health goal. And here's my, mm -hmm. and it's like, I don't know, to, to me, it's, there's too much. It, it's just like, 
how do you even manage all of that that stuff right mm -hmm. to, i'd rather say okay let, let me let me figure out like this is like kind of the objective of this quarter this is what i want to like get done or what i'm really focusing on or what i'm into or interested in right now in my life and i tend to be i guess probably more like like grant cardone like a more obsessed right i become obsessed with that thing yeah. and just like devote as much time and effort to that that one thing and as i do that i develop in it very fast and then it becomes sort of like a base like it becomes a bunch of habits develop from that, which yeah. keeps me at that level, right? So that's mm -hmm. how I've been able to kind of keep at my fitness level and things like that, even though when I'm focusing on other things, because the running, the lifting, right, the diet, it all becomes a habit and I don't have to focus as intensely on that. There's actually a really good book by Tynan called Superhuman by Habit. Yeah, yeah, I've seen part of that one. Yeah, yeah. He talks about about this and about basically establishing habits in his life, and then they become they don't require as much willpower. And I think James Clear is putting out a book too that's going to have a similar type of thing. Uh, I'm trying to remember. It's called Atomic Atomic Habits. It hasn't come out yet, but yeah, man, he's super prolific, impressive guy. He is. Uh, yeah. So are you are you going to get into this in bulldog mindset like the step by step the, the belief versus the belief versus why the step by step on you know from a goal aspiration to a, a process based goal like how to break them down I love the one thing at a time and one maybe secondary one I love that um, or do you get into this in bulldog mindset will you I, I think I've probably talked on on some of these subjects on the channel I don't think yeah. I've done a video yet on the whole the why versus the the belief that's so something that <laughs> it's kind of new as, yeah. as i hash these things out and, and, yeah. and think about it so you can tell that there's a lot of things that, I, that i've kind of thought about a lot so i already have yeah. the, the, you know the, the answer for it or it's like my life philosophy so mm. but uh, with the goal thing too I, I know i've talked about the goal the goal the goal thing before but I'll, I'll probably you know honestly what i'll probably do is try to take a lot of these things and put together a bulldog mindset course eventually that will have kind of all of this nice. in there, right? Because a lot of times when I'm making videos, right, it's, and I do so many videos, it's just what I'm thinking of the time, all right? Or what's yeah. it's not yeah. really planned out to be like very sequential yeah. and, and stuff. So there might be stuff that, that you'll find from time to time, but it's, it's more like, what am I going through and what am I thinking about now, as opposed to like a, a logical progression of this is how you achieve your goals in life. This is how you get in shape. This is how you, you know, do these things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not prescriptive. It's more just sharing, sharing thoughts. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, I mean, it's free content too. So why, why yeah. would it all be perfect? Uh, one big thing you talked about, which is so overarching, this has got to be in every other video, especially the bulldog mindset stuff is avoiding external sources of validation. And, you know, big ways I think about this are caring about, you know, what people think in making your own decisions that affect you. And then, going after goals that require specific gatekeepers versus goals that you have more control over, like maybe your own fitness. How do you think about external, like avoiding external validation and what are some examples of, you know, external validation that you used to seek and you, you got rid of? Sure. Yeah. So the way I think about it is when you, you know, external validation is when you feel like something that someone else has or they can give you, is what you need to feel good about yourself, right? That's that's really what external validation comes from, right? It's the approval of someone else and the acceptance of someone else or the love of someone else. It's something that you feel like externally you need in order for, for you to be uh, complete, happy, whatever it is, fulfilled. And in, in it, it sort of, you know, the, the rejection of this sort of comes again from the, the stoic philosophy, stoic mindset, which mm -hmm. is, I don't want to be tied to anything that I can't directly control, right? A uh, really good book on this, the whole mindset of this is uh, As a Man Thinketh, or, uh, oh no, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Oh yeah. As a Man Thinketh is also really good, but Man's Search yeah. for Meaning, right? It, it's a total self-empowerment book. And, and, if, and, and the whole idea of Stoic philosophy is this idea that I do not want fate, you know? I, I love it in, in Nicholas uh, Taleb, 
uh, Nassim's book in, I think, I forget, I think maybe it's an anti-fragile or it might be like uh, Black Swan. He says that a, a Stoic is a Buddhist who says, fuck you to fate, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely see that. <laughs> I love that quote because that's that's the whole thing is it's like I want to say fuck you to fate as much as possible right so if I rely on other people's approval of me right if I get my feeling of goodness of fulfillment of joy or whatever it is if, if it's anywhere external then I can't control that because I can't control other people I can't control circumstances right so I am basically a passenger in the car instead of the driver I don't want to be the passenger right? Mm -hmm. I want to be the driver. I want to be able to control my fate. I want to be able to control how I feel and, and my internal state and to be able to access that at will. Otherwise, I'm just at the whims of the universe and, and whatever fate brings my way, right? So that's yeah. sort of the kind of the psychological basis for rejecting external validation, right? So uh, as far as, you know, the common sources, uh, myself, I think, Probably a, a lot of guys, right? A lot of the coaching I do uh, involves involves guys that are seeking external gal validation from women, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's probably women too, right? I think women probably, and you see this, right? I mean, you see the yeah. kind of stereotypical women who you know they have daddy issues, or right? It's because they never got the validation, the external validation, the approval from their from their father, and so they're looking for it in a man, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but definitely a lot of guys, especially with my background in the, the software development field and a lot of the, the audience I had with Simple Programmer, they yeah. like feel like they're not attractive to women. They're not, you know, they're, they're tying up all of their value of themselves as a human being and their ability to like for, for women to like them or for a woman to like them. And mm -hmm. that's totally external validation. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it comes off as extremely needy. It actually makes it so that what they're trying to accomplish is, is less likely because they're going to people feel that when you when they need when oh, you, yeah. i need your validation yeah. in order for like they feel that pressure Definitely. they know they know yeah, that sales and sales and everything everything exactly so so you know I, I i definitely had to overcome that i had to learn that i had to just learn a trial by fire just by going out there and just becoming comfortable just talking uh with girls just going over you know facing my fears getting over that that comfort getting out of that comfort zone but but more importantly i think it, it's 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 a shift it's the focus in instead of saying like this person determines like i feel good because this person says that you know that i'm a good person or they like me or they think i'm valuable to thinking more of the mindset of okay what makes me feel like i'm awesome right what makes yeah. me right i know my own potential no one else knows that right uh, one mm -hmm. of the things I, I tell people all the time is sometimes people will say well john you know it's it's great like you you, you did this awesome thing or you know <laughs> you, right and you made this money and like dude yeah. you're in such good shape like uh, or whatever it is and you know i wish i could i could do what you could do and 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 i, I appreciate that but at the same time i don't value it uh because I value what I think, right? So I could have an awesome day, right? I could have, I could run a PR, right? And in a race or something or whatever it is, or I can make a million bucks, right? Mm -hmm. And I know internally whether I gave it my all or whether I was capable of more or, you know, if I got lucky or not, right? I know this, right? So I base my value on that. Right. That's that's how I evaluate because that's the most important thing to me. And and, and really, you know, shifting to, to avoid that external validation trap is about shifting that mindset to say, you know, it's basically I don't give a fuck what other people think. I care what I think about my like to, to start asking the question is, you know, because a lot of times like we get caught in this trap. We're like, well, you know, it's just like you're asking before, like, well, you know, how do you define what is enough money to make, right? It's like, yeah. is, it, is it based on this or is it, is it based on what other people say or success, right? Uh, you have to avoid that trap. You have to start saying, yeah. we have to start asking ourselves the question and say, okay, what, what do I think? Like, forget the noise, you know, let's, let's block out all the noise, forget all this, you know, and, and, and don't listen to any other voice or any other word in here and just like listen to yourself and say, what do you honestly think? Like, what is your evaluation of this, right? If you draw something, do you think it looks good? Do you like it? <laughs> do, you, yeah, do you like that picture? You know what I mean? yeah. If you yeah. love it, doesn't matter. 99 people can say this is a piece of shit. Doesn't fucking matter. Like, 
you, yeah. you got to get to, and, and if you're not at that point, then you're in some way seeking external validation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and when you get to that point, it's awesome because, and, and no one's perfect, right? I'm not perfect. I, you know, th th I'm not going to say that I never, ever seek external validation, but, but the more so that you're on that spectrum of caring more about what you think than what other people think, the more you're in control of your circumstances and your inner state and the more empowered that you are because you can control that. You now have the ability to make yourself feel good. You have the ability like to, uh, to, to lift your state, to, to lift yourself and to, to, you know, to set your own direction in life. You, now you're the, you're the driver in the car instead of the passenger right? You're not sitting in the back seat anymore. You're in the front seat. Your will is what is, is determining your actions in life as opposed to, you know, it, otherwise you're, you're, like I said, you're in the back seat of the car. You're like a pinball being knocked around the pinball machine, right? It's just random luck. It just happens to be what people tell you and what other people think and society thinks is controlling your actions. And that's what is, is knocking you around. There's, there's no sense to it. Whereas, when it's all about what do you think and, and internal validation, right? What is important to you? Now it's focused. Now it's, it's a gun. Now you're shooting a bullet in a direction at a target that you want as opposed to being knocked around a pinball machine as a pinball just randomly off of what other people's opinions and thoughts are. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. I've, I've seen that, that theme come up a couple of times too. I know it was repeated just recently in this, uh, the video in Madrid where you're talking about, you know, the prejudice you experience with people expecting you maybe not to have enough money to be in certain places. And, uh, you actually mentioned you went from like not caring to making it like a game in your head. Like oh, I'm about to prove you wrong. <laughs> right. So like, so like, how do you go from there? Like what would you have been thinking like 10 years ago? If someone was like, you know, looking at you shady or whatever in a store versus now. I, I, would, I would be thinking that I need to do something. I need to remove myself from the situation or I need to, sh I need to like prove to them yeah. that I'm, I'm good enough in some way, uh, yeah. you know, as opposed to being amused by it and, and thinking that, oh, if you, if you only knew that it's, it's kind of fun, <laughs> like, like being entertained yeah. by, by that. Right. I, I would think that I need to show off or prove to them in some way, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, thinking that it's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's a funny thing. So, Yeah. I think that's uh, most of them. I have one last question here about, it's kind of a big topic, but I just want to get your general thoughts. Um, mm. I know you help a lot of guys now. You talk specifically about a lot of the problems uh, guys have. You know, I'd say the majority of your advice in your channel is applicable to everyone, man or woman, but then there's a little subset that's like really tailored towards guys struggling. Sure. And a big, a big part of that you've brought up, many people brought up is there's not a good definition of you know masculinity for a lot of people to model. So what, what do you think masculinity is and how does that affect how you help some of the guys you coach, some of the guys in your community? So it, I think it relates very closely to what we were talking about with the external validation, right? To me, yeah. masculinity is, is all about being a driving force, right? Knowing what you want, going after what you want, and not giving a fuck what anyone else thinks about it. It doesn't mean yeah. being an asshole. It doesn't mean not caring about other people or not have been considerate of other people. It just means that as far as your value judgment of what's important to you and what is valuable, it comes internally. Like you're the one who it has the locus of control. You're the one who sets the direction of your life. You will listen to advice, but you trust yourself more than anyone else. And you're, and you're willing to take the risk and you're willing to accept the consequences of your choices. You're, you're going out there, you're facing your fears. Uh, you're, you're, you're driving yourself. You, you're the, you're the force, right? The rock, the thing that someone can depend on uh, because you're not, you, you know, I, I think like the opposite, a lot of like emasculated men, like you can think of it as, as the, the, you know, the cliche of the married guy that's like, Oh, let me check with the wife or let me get permission <laughs> from the boss. Right. That's yeah, the yeah. opposite. That's the mm -hmm. exact opposite of masculinity. Why? Because that person is not self-directed. They're not willing to take consequences uh, for their own actions in life. That that person does not does give a fuck what other people think, right? He he doesn't have he he's got to check. He's got to check to see is this good? Is this is this right? Right? Whereas a, a very masculine man is someone who's going to take charge. Who's going to say, you know what? I trust myself. I trust myself, and 
if I'm wrong, I'm willing to accept those consequences. And, and you can trust me because I'm going to be going this direction, right? You can come with me or not, but I'm going this direction and I'm confident in that choice. And, and like I said, if things go wrong, I'll take responsibility for that. That's, that's that whole thing. And I think we're missing so much of that from society. And we get this whole, you know, toxic masculinity and all this, this kind of bullshit because guys are afraid to step up and they don't understand. They don't see that kind of positive role. It's not about necessarily being macho or being an, an asshole, but, but definitely guys that are more on that spectrum. The reason why they're more masculine is because they don't give a fuck what other people think. Right. And yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a positive way to do that where you're making, making, you're improving people's lives. Right. And we need those people. We need those warriors. We, we would not survive as a species. We would not be here had we not had, you know, brave men who were masculine men who took charge, who took direction or, or you know, gave direction, who, who took charge of their lives and, and plowed forward and were willing to accept the consequences for their actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. So many of those phrases have so much baggage, but it's like, you know, just being proactive, making decisions and taking responsibility for those decisions. It's like you're, you're halfway there. There's nothing controversial about those things, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic. But um, hey, John, I, uh, I'm going to cut it and we can chat after. I really want to thank you for coming on and sharing so much of your wisdom uh, and just all the great content you put out. Thank you. Yeah, and, yeah, and I got to say, you know, uh, as, as we're wrapping this up, great job in in the research <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. really good question like you knew what to ask so uh, it, that's that's appreciated you, you you've got uh, a talent for this so thank you